Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Nathan Massengill. So, welcome to the show, Nathan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's, it's great, an honor. It's great to have you on the show. Now, just as an introduction, Nathan is the author and artist for the Viscera graphic novel series. His comic credits include Wolverine, X-Men, Batman, and other New York Times best-selling comics. He's also collaborated with notable creatives, including Joss Whedon on Buffy and also with Christopher Nolan. Now, just uber famous, Nathan. That's that's an amazing list of credits. Oh, no. No, no, it's, it's comics. Uh, it's comics. <laughs> I know, but within the world, I mean, it, comics have this amazing audience, right? They're, fans of comics are uber fans. Yeah, they, they really are. I, I have often said, and I just came back from a convention in Pensacola, uh, where they expected um, 3,500 people to come at the most, and around 15,000 ended up showing up. They had to turn them away. It was more people than had ever been at a convention in Pensacola before. So uh, this wow. is a big change from when I started in comics, when you were very lucky to get you know, 100, 200, 300 people. The, the fans are growing. The online world is expanding it exponentially. Um, and, and comic book fans are incredibly loyal, kind, supportive, generous. They're the best highest quality fans any author could hope for. That's that's amazing. So, yeah, you talked a bit there about starting. Can you just tell us a bit more about your career and how you've progressed? Um, well, I I um, since kindergarten, that's all I've ever done. Uh, when I when I got out of high school, I went 2 years to um, a technical school um, run by Joe Kubert called the Joe Kubert School of Art. Uh, that actually trains comic book artists, and um, I got to work with Joe Kubert there, one of the great legends in American comics, and um, it was a wonderful experience, and from there, I just, as soon as I got out of school, I started doing small jobs, and in about 1992, uh, I worked on my first Wonder Woman comic book, who happens to be my favorite superhero character to this day, so, I, uh, and I've done it ever since. And and I mean, and how about the difference between working on comics and then working on things like like Buffy? I mean, I guess you know you've got to think of me as not knowing anything. Um, how how does that progression work? Well, Joss Whedon decided um, a wonderful thing. You know, since Buffy on television was canceled, and everybody wanted the series to continue, obviously, including uh, Joss Whedon, he decided, you know, why don't we continue the um, the TV show in comics? So he did season eight and season nine of Buffy as a comic book, and it's really been um, amazing to see a TV show live on in a way um, that otherwise. You know, it would just be a piece of history already, and and still it's going on. And I got to work on a little bit, just a little bit of season nine. And since Joss Whedon is one of my favorite creators, um, it was great to work on on his project. And I love Buffy. I think Buffy is one of the great characters in um, in cinema. Yeah, abs absolutely. That's that's amazing. And you you mentioned Wonder Woman there as one of your favorites. And of course, your comic uh, Viscera uh, the, is a female protagonist, um, very kick ass. Um, what what is your uh, attraction to the strong female character? Well, um, you you could probably answer that as well as I could um, with your wonderful characters. And um, I think honestly, um, I. I find female characters um, as leads to be to be much more interesting. We see a lot less of them. Um, I think there's a lot more you can do with them dramatically, especially in um, in a um, combat situations. And um, it, it just it just is something that we see a lot less of. I enjoy them more. I would watch. Um, when Hercules and Xena were on at the same time, I'm a Xena guy. I was watching Lucy Lawless as Xena. And um, I, I have always felt, you know, um, that um, the female leads were, were strongly underrepresented. And I've naturally always written um, strong female leads. Mm. And, I mean, I guess the, the impression with most of the women in comics is they have kind of large breasts and small waists and quite, you know, and isn't it the chain mail armor? Is that the kind of stereotypical? <laughs> yeah, comic comics, especially in the 1990s, went through this long period of, uh, of, of kind of um, 
extremely, you know, sexist depictions of the characters. And strangely, although the depictions were sexist, often the, the characters themselves, beyond the, the, the rendering and the rendition of the characters, were actually kind of unusually um, dominant and powerful. They weren't weak or submissive. They were very strong, but the, the drawings themselves were very, um, were very uh, you know, sexist in the, in the way they were just portrayed. But then again, as many of my fellow artists have pointed out, you know, um, uh, we don't look like Superman either, and you know, we're not complaining about it. So um, that's my friend Adam Hughes always says that, and um, you know, so the, the, everyone in a superhero world is is extremely extreme in their physicality. Viscera was is my um, is in that range because of the particular theme that I've chosen, and she's kind of. Um, People are supposed to expect one thing from her and get entirely the opposite. So it's kind of playing on that paradigm of um, what you see is not always what you get. And um, I think that uh, it's it's very interesting. And, and comics are changing a lot. Uh, there are um, usually they're at the forefront of um, you know um, cultural changes, particularly related to women. I, and I hope they'll continue to go forward in that. Although. There are some notable misses. Yeah. Well, no, it's interesting you say that because I, um, you know, my character, Morgan Sierra, as I kind of see as my alter ego, you know, of course, is perfectly proportioned and can fight and can do all these things. It's kind of near a superhero. So we all, and, I've, and I don't complain when, you know, Thor takes his top off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't heard any women complaining about Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, I mean, sexism in in lots of things, you know. It, in, in fact, I think the beauty standard was pretty much reversed in the Avengers movie. Uh, that everybody that everybody was going to see the guys, and um, you know, and and the Black Widow um, as awesome as she is, and the actress is Scarlett Johansson. Um, she was she was overshadowed by by her male leads, which is something very unusual and um, not unwelcome, um, just different. Mm. And just just on that, with the gender balance, I'm wondering with actual comic book artists like yourself, is it is it a male dominated industry? Uh, well, it's that was the thing when we were when I was um, growing up and uh, when I started in the business. You would go to a comic book convention, and there would be absolutely no women there. I'm not talking about maybe one or two or three. None. And if one did walk in, it was the wife or the girlfriend of the guy who was, uh, you know, dragging her along. And she was very uncomfortable because everybody was looking at her and like, what is that woman doing here? And, you know, how, how well, you know, everybody was just, and nobody likes to be looked at and singled out and, and stared at. And particularly since I think women are finding a greater access to comics. You can, anybody can now go to Amazon and, and download comics and be involved in it. And we've finally been able to disprove, you know, a, a lot of the things that the big bosses think about what women want is um, obviously completely idiotic and usually absolutely wrong. And it turns out, you know, women can like the Avengers, you know, and the and the old thinking was that, that women would never like the Avengers um, and that you couldn't even have female leads in comic books because who would read them? Guys won't want to read that and women won't. Well, they weren't in the audience at that time. And now I think women make up a, a significant portion of the readership, and it's growing all the time. And um, I, it's, it's revolutionized comics, and um, it's made it really a lot more fun to be involved in comics. Mm, fantastic. And, and um, sort of conventions like Comic-Con would be the, the famous one, right? And everybody kind of dresses up. Um, all yes. the pictures seem to be men and women now. It just seems to be a lot yes. of fun. Do you, do you dress yes. up at these conventions? Oh, no, no. I, nobody wants to see me in a, in a Thor costume. Or a th <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen. No, no. I, I, I leave that to the experts. Um, I, I, uh, the cosplayers uh, are amazing, and uh, they, uh, they brought a lot of fun to a convention, and, and uh, some of the costumes they create are, are better than movie-quality costumes. It's really amazing, and everybody has fun. And, and women are feeling more and more comfortable at these conventions, you know, even – even though they get a lot of the same flack they get in, in, in the world outside. You know, I hope that you know, the comic book community and the fandom 
for um, science fiction and fantasy will continue to be more and more uh, embracing of the cosplayers and, you know, people that just go to have fun and have a great time. Mm, I must say, I, w- I would really fancy dressing up in some of this stuff. It just, it does look really, but just very expensive, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, they spend so much time on these things. They build the things from scratch, and and they they have a, it's like a whole lifestyle. And I can't imagine I would never want to dress up as any character at all. Uh, but I I admire it. I'm always stopping people who are walking by my table to run out and take a picture with them. Um, and uh, I just I admire it so much and the enthusiasm. And um, you know it's 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 an incredibly exciting environment to be in. Mm. And uh, I just, uh, like I said, conventions today are nothing like they were in the past. Mm. And I wonder, I mean, what do you uh, attribute the, the, I mean, it really is mainstream now, you know, Marvel and, I mean, the movies we watch, a a lot of these blockbuster movies are superhero movies now. Um, You know, I think recently I watched watched The Man of Steel. I mean, I love explosion movies, so all these movies that I really love, (laughs) The Avengers. I mean, Wolverine. (laughs) Wolverine was fantastic, you know. Hugh so, Jackman, yeah. A yes. woman like Hugh Jackman for some reason. I don't yeah. know why. Oh, shirt off fight scene. I mean, <laughs> that was the best with swords. Dangerous it's stuff. amazing, yeah. It yeah. was amazing. But what? why do you think people just want this, you know, want the superhero stuff? I mean, what, what is it that is wrong with our society that we want that? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think that, and it's something I've thought about a lot because, you know, I loved superheroes when I was a kid. And I just assumed, you know, I would do the same thing. I'd find girls and, and you know, get car, get interested in cars or sports or something and just grow out of this crazy phase. But um, I really never stopped liking superheroes because they changed. Um, around 1986, when I was at that, you know, 16 year old period where I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to switch out. Alan Moore's comics started coming out. The Watchmen came out. Um, um, Frank Miller's The Dark Knight came out, and there was a renaissance of uh, of comic books, which were revisionist that they didn't follow the old scripts, where people suddenly began to take it seriously, began to listen to what Will Eisner and and the original generation of comic book artists were saying comic books could be, and um, and you know people stopped burning them in piles, ca- calling them the devil's literature and all that stuff, and uh, and and they just they just grew up along with me, and so I've. Uh, constantly found something new to be interested in you know what the reasons i was interested in wonder woman um have changed over the years as you know you begin to you begin to think about what a character like this means uh you you, if you're uh, a feminist or into feminist uh theory and you look at you look at buffy and a lot of buffy fans have a great time saying is she really feminist is it a really a feminist um series and is wonder woman really feminist and if not why not why is where's the miss where's the disconnect and and so um you can really bring that kind of analysis to these power fantasies but people love them because everybody wants to be able to do what a superhero does you like the explosions and people making the explosions you like morgan sierra because you know what other people would only think about doing she just goes out and does it you know and she's not afraid and she's smart and she's pretty and she shoots stuff and (laughs) she's just great we you know and and who doesn't want to do that i mean it's a lot more fun than reading um you know a book about um you know politics or something (laughs) who cares i I totally agree with you and i also think that uh i mean a lot of these characters have uh, the dark side and they are complicated characters they're not just simple anymore are they they've all got this dark side and also they you know there's a, a battle and an overcoming and i mean all the great character creation is in these superheroes really it's true i mean they come out of you know they come out of myth um, modern mythology modern the modern symbols of mythology have come out of comic books you know um, everything from superman's s to batman's bat symbol to just there's a million iconic images um that have come out of uh of these myths and everyone is they've Humans have always loved myths and ideas of things bigger than ourselves, beyond ourselves, to get out of our ordinary common world. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, comics came out of, um, you know, Pulp Fiction, which was really dark and, and really harsh. And, and, and they came out of, of that world and it imbued all that 
a material and up until the 50s in America um, comic books really had a lot of, of roundness and depth and thought put into them and then of course the government censored comics effectively censored them and shut them down thank you McCarthy and um, and and they were kind of you know after that point put in this little um, image of this is a child's literature, you know, and, and they're only recovering, beginning to recover from that, you know, in, in the past few years. And mm. um, now people take them very seriously thanks to some very pioneering um, creative individuals, you know, who've outlived that vicious censorship. Yeah, no, I would agree with you. And um, so just getting into the, the more kind of technical side of things, um, you're, what do you actually do? So do you, you write stuff in, on a, you know, type stuff, and then do you draw with a pen and paper or on a computer system? Or how do you actually work? Yeah. <laughs> I, do, I, I do all the different aspects. Um, I've always wanted to be a writer-artist, which is a kind of a rare combination of um, of 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 creator like Frank Miller who who writes his own material and draws it as well, but typically comics are broken up into some subcategories. Like a band is broken up into subcategories. Uh, a lot of my career has been spent as a finisher or an inker, uh, where I'm kind of a, just a, um, a part of a of a of a team that's creating a book. And um, other times I've been fortunate to write something or color it or letter it. Um, in it, all the different aspects I've enjoyed doing, um, and um, it's it's just very interesting. But it, it's, it's broken down into a lot of little minute um, technical uh, lingo and subcategories, and um, you know, it's small little kind of very small teams to create the book. But they're almost always created by teams of people. Mm. And and but if people want to have a go at drawing, I'm just thinking of like because a lot your viscera looks like it's hand drawn, but I presume is that hand drawn or is it drawn on a computer yes, yes. program? Yes, this viscera is viscera is definitely hand drawn, although there are computer elements to it. Uh, the 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 genre right now is moving um, more and more digital. More all of the color that you see in the um, in the mainstream books at Marvel, DC, and Dark Horse, almost all of it is going to be done on computer. Um, and the lettering, there used to be you know, people who made their living doing hand lettering for comics now, um, and people make their living doing digital lettering for comics. And so a lot of the process, even a hand-drawn kind of organic-looking book like Viscera, is going to have computer elements. And so you, you, sometimes you'll draw it on on you know, on your little drawing board and you put it on your scanner and you put it in the computer and then you think, oh my gosh, there's a million ways I can improve this. And, um, and uh, so it's, it's a very um, integrated process and a lot of people are doing it many different ways. I can do Viscera entirely digitally and never touch a paper, but I feel like with, with that particular book was very experimental in its style and, and very organic. And so I was really interested in minimalism and just going back to very simple, um, simple style, um, black and white only, no grays, nothing. And, um, just seeing how little information I could put on a page to tell the story, to, to make it more immersive for the reader. Um, us crazy artists, we think of all that kind of stuff. You, you do the same thing as a novelist when you're thinking of, you know, am I going to make a really flowery description uh, in this on this page, or is it going to slow down the narrative pace so much? Artists think of exactly the same thing. When I listen to your podcast and the authors are talking about things that go into novels, it's surprising how exactly similar they are to the artistic process or the process of writing a comic. Mm, because of course you I mean you might have one line of dialogue or maybe no dialogue and and you've drawn you've you've drawn a scene with a background a backdrop a physical setting and an action so you've you only I mean you almost don't have to say a lot you just have to draw it <laughs> right and there's an old saying in comics uh, show don't tell and um, I think it's a great rule for novelists as well, you know, that it, 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 it's a lot better if you can um, suggest what your hero is doing um, 
in, in a kind of parallel narrative or a parallel idea rather than just saying, now John is angry. You know, in the comic book, you, you show them as angry. You know, it, it, Hulk breaks a wall down and you know he's mad. So, I mean, it's a lot more fun to see him break the wall down than to say in the caption, Hulk angry. Uh, all the, well, that's kind of fun. But you know what I mean. And um, so with the comic book, you're juggling like these, these multiple narratives. There's incredibly long sequences in Viscera where I have almost no dialogue. And I have that opportunity um, to, um, to, to move the reader through that scene much like you would with quick shots in, a, in, an, act, in, a, in an action movie. And, um, you know, um, and it, so it's a lot of fun. And then, and then when, I, when I'm getting into these like intimate moments, you know, where they're sitting by a fireside and they're talking, you know, I just switched it all to text because that's a data dump. That's a time when, okay, you can skip it as a reader. Uh, or if you're really interested in the kind of uh, you know fireside chat, which I think is one of the best parts of the book, then you you'll sit down and you'll be immersed in the dialogue itself and not not distracted by um, the uh, the two people sitting around talking, which is a very thing to it's an easy thing to shoot in a movie. It's a great thing to write in a novel, but it really really sucks in a comic book. Because, you know, the last thing you want Hulk to do is sit at a bar and talk with the other Avengers, you know, and then the camera goes back and the camera, you know, you, you don't want talking heads in a comic book. And that's one way that comics are um, very different than films and novels and everything else. There's, there's, there's things that you can do in the medium of a comic book that you can't do in any other medium. And uh, it gives you all kinds of creative license and unlimited special effects budget. Um, and, um, you know, just a really, uh, you get to work with, uh, if your artist is very good and he can make your characters act and he can bring your setting in and make you feel like you're really in China or really on the moon, you know, then you as a writer can really cut back on, on what narrative you need to put in place and really just focus your words on that, on that one iconic idea. Alan Moore will often write a story in his dialogue that's absolutely separate from what you're watching in the background mm. so that you have this incredibly textural and visual experience that sometimes merge and sometimes move forward, but it's, it's never replicated. You know, he's never saying in his dialogue or in his word balloons what you're um, looking at because they never need to be replicated. Mm. It, it, it is absolutely fascinating. It really is. And, and then in terms of uh, actually producing and, and distributing a, a comic, so once you've made it digitally, um, how are things working now with print versus digital? How are you getting work out there and, and how are others getting work out there? Well, it's, it's, it's again, been a, a real revolution, very exciting time, um, because, you know, there was a huge barrier before the Internet world. There was an incredible barrier, particularly to color comics. I mean, you would have to order to get any kind of um, really great um, reproduction or really to make it cost-effective, you might have to order 20,000 copies, you know. Now... Um, there's um, wonderful print-on-demand um, publishers, particularly my friend uh, Barry Gregory, who runs a company called Kablam, uh, K-A-B-L-A-M.com, and um, he will print a color book at the same cost. He will print 100, he will print one, and you know he will send them you know just like the other print fulfillment orders, but they're as good as um, books run on, a, on an offset press. They're beautiful. It, every book he takes care with, and, you know, so you might run your comic book for a dollar or two, you know, and, um, you know, one copy at a time. So an author can, can invest in a, in a color comic and not uh, have to have, you know, those classic boxes of books sitting around. Um, and even comics can do that now. And, uh, and that, that breaking the color barrier um, that way has been great. And, of course, the digital revolution is even better um, mm. in a lot of ways um, as it's expanding. The, the, the devices are getting better and better at displaying them. And so I'm hoping that comics will get out of the, out of the you know, boutique market they're in and come back into the forefront of, um, of, of literature the way um, the movies have done uh, for comics. Mm. So, I mean, I've read about uh, Kindle Comic Creator, which is a, a new thing. Do you know anything about that? I did put Viscera into the comic 
Kindle Comic Creator. It was a really interesting process um, because it particularly with Viscera has a very unconventional experimental panel structure. Panels are the little um, boxes that you read to one at a time. And um, so um, I spent a lot of time like shooting the book like I would I would create where the panel goes and overlap the panels so that there's a kind of cinematic experience almost uh, for the book and I ended up like uh, some things even worked better in the Kindle Creator than they work in the book but it's it's awkward because you know uh, I think a lot of the things that comic Kindle Kindle comic creator is doing now is is like um, um, it's difficult to say but it's it's kind of uh, compensating for the uh, the lack of resolution and the lack of screen size that's still there. Where the next generation or two of devices um, or the larger devices presently are going to really change that idea. The comic, Kindle Comic Creator, instead of displaying the whole static page, will z- zoom in and give you a guided panel view so that you'll switch from one panel to another. It took me three days to, to, to set up those panel views Three working days, very long days, and it was very interesting. But it is not a simple process, and uh, for, especially for a, for a one man shop, um, it's it's not uh, terribly easy. But it was satisfying to do, and very interesting. And the software is great. Anybody can do it. Anyone with three days and is a comic man like yourself. <laughs> But but I guess what it does show is that Amazon believe that comics are a market. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done this. Um, comics are a huge market. The comic book print market, even, which people have been proclaiming dead since about 1996, um, is is resurging. Um, the uh, comic book print market in 2012, I believe, resurged 12%. So it's coming back even. And the digital market is expanding exponentially every year. Um, we, we still... Um, have a lot of issues of comics being kind of segregated off in a different distribution chain than novels. One of the things that I've enjoyed listening to your show for is because you know you're talking about how to put you know novels into the into the digital distribution chain, how to get noticed, how to get brought forward. But for comics creators, it's very difficult because we're even in a submarket of a submarket. So I've been really interested in seeing if I could apply some of the rules and guidance that you so generously and brilliantly bring forward on your show and, uh, and, and, and apply that to a graphic novel. You know, I haven't achieved success at it yet, but uh, you know, the, the process is still ongoing, and I'm really interested in, in getting, out of, um, getting out of the sub-market um, and, and seeing if there's a way to bridge um, novels and graphic novels. I think it's something that uh, novelists should really – I'd love to see those markets integrate, um, and um, a lot more novelists do graphic novels, and a lot more graphic novelists do novels, and maybe even make hybrid editions, um, really kind of supplement – uh, I mean, there's a lot of potential to do novel and innovative things and expand novelists if they would go and, and you know make novel graphic novels out of their novels. Hey, you know that's an extra market, extra piece for your market. That's something brand new that you can even though it's the same story that you've already invested all that time in writing. Suddenly, you've got a new product, and everybody that loves your book is going to want to read the graphic novel, and people are going to read the graphic novel that didn't read the novel. Mm-hmm. And there's no other way, I think, that a novelist or graphic novelist could reach a completely different market. There's not a lot of crossover between the comic book market and the um, and the novel market, but the fans of both are extraordinary. And it's like um, I think that uh, the more these markets merge and the more um, people consider there to be very little difference between a novel and a graphic novel in terms of what they will buy, Mm. uh, the better it will be for both uh, genres. Yeah, I mean... When you think about, I mean, when I write, I think about it as a movie because I love the action movies. And actually, I mean, yeah. it's such yeah. a tiny percentage of people that will ever see their books as a movie. But realistically, a graphic novel is kind of the the closest you can get, uh, really, isn't yeah, it? it? Yeah, it is the bridge. Um, a lot of people view it as the bridge. A lot of um, I know a lot of directors now, major directors who are saying. You know, if you want me to read your script, make it a graphic novel, then I'll look at it. They won't even look at the print scripts anymore. They're pulling all their work out of graphic novels because if you think about it, the graphic novel is a movie that's already way down the line. I did, I've done a small 
article on my website about this, so maybe I can go into more depth on it there. But it's like a novel is um, a, an enormous work of imagination to translate into film, but a graphic novel is already the sets are built, all the characters are cast. Um, you know, the, the complete world is designed, all these elements are there, the pacing is there, uh, the storyboards, the all-important storyboards um, are there. And the difference between a storyboards, which directors shoot from, and a graphic novel are really not that different. In fact, it's usually comic book artists and illustrators who are doing those, um, those storyboards for the director. So it's like already their movie is moved um, five steps forward, and they can really see it. They can see what's wrong. They can see what's right. They can see what they can improve, which is probably great for them because, you know, they're going to look forward to changing things around. And um, so I think it's it's the gateway between um, the two. It's particularly hard to get a. It's it's easier to get a novel read than a screenplay, perhaps, um, because directors just have piles of them. It's a lot easier to pick up a, a graphic novel. You can look through it in a few seconds and know if you're going to like it or not. You can't do that with the screenplay. You can't do it in any other way. It's very, very um, appealing to time-strapped people in Hollywood. Okay, so now I'm really excited, and I'm sure lots of people listening are also excited. So um, if people want to work with a graphic artist like yourself, uh, you know, because most novelists or writers are not going to be able to do this on their own because you need an artist. So how would people find and work with um, graphic artists who are up for doing this kind of thing? Well, um, the article I've done on my website covers a lot of this, but the basic thing you want to do is you want to, um, you know, if you know a comic book artist, ask them who's good, who's available. Uh, I do a lot of consulting work. People often, um, you know, write me and say, you know, I've got a novel. Is it a, is, is it a good um, graphic novel? I have a friend of mine who's a brilliant novelist, and he'll often bring me his concept, and I'll say, uh-uh, no, that's not a novel. That's a graphic novel. And he'll completely write his 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 novel in that form and I'll say what you have is primarily in your novel visual therefore you know it's gonna it's gonna play better and quicker and be more immersive as a graphic novel so you can go to a consultant and really decide uh, whether or not your book is appropriate um, for a graphic novel whether if it's a lot of just talking heads you know then you, you you have worries but if you have action scenes if you have sequences if you have a mystery that involves a lot of visual elements if you have um, you know a celebrity bio or a techno thriller um, all these things make fantastic graphic novels and so you should go to a consultant and they will recommend you um, to an artist um, who always go with somebody that has experience doing comic books. Um, just a graphic artist, as you say, uh, will not necessarily be a good comic book artist. A comic book artist is a subspecialty of a subspecialty. It's one of the hardest and most difficult fields of all commercial art because um, you have to draw so many panels so often. You have to be able to draw everything in great volume very quickly. And um, so you, you want to go with an, with an expert, with somebody who's done it, has a proven track record. And, um, you know, so that's why you want to um, talk to people who, who've done it and, and, and get linked up with somebody. But if you do that, and it's not that hard because it's the online world now, um, you know, you can find an artist who's excited about your work, who gets it, um, who has this, this, this style, and you can have this mutual admiration society of people and um, you can get it funded uh, pretty easily you know um, if if your book I would say if your book uh, is already successful say you published your novel and it sold over 3500 copies then I think you should definitely begin to consider making it a graphic novel if you're over 5000 yeah you definitely should have one why not and if you're over 15,000 in sales, it's a no-brainer. I mean, you've got to do it because it, you should have the fan audience to easily crowdfund it and, um, and get it done. And it's, mm -hmm. it's just going to expand the, 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 the amount of um, difference it will make. I think to a novelist audience is, is, is incredible. It gets you into comic book audiences. You can merge your fan base with an artist fan base. You, you get these great fans that you've never had before. You, you, know, you can all important add to that catalog. You've talked on your show so often about getting to that magical number of, of, of books 
And graphic novel, you can put one right in there. You know, you could make <laughs> deluxe editions of your novel bound with the graphic novel in a digital world. So many possibilities. Mm. It really is. And I mean, you mentioned, um, I mean, really, we're talking funding. So we're talking Kickstarter, uh, things like that. And and I don't want people to think it's easy um, because, I mean, I've always shied away from Kickstarter because, you know, even I've been online for a while now, but I don't feel like I would doubt that I have the, you know, a big enough audience. I, you know, it. I think we all feel this, you know, sort of worry that it wouldn't be there. So if people do want to do Kickstarter and get funding, what sort of funding level would we be talking about for a graphic novel? Um, well, that's a tricky thing. Um, I think that, and it's tricky because when you go with Kickstarter or Indiegogo or some of the others, it's not only Kickstarter. Um, each one has different, um, you know, different attributes and different um, value um, and different accessibility levels. Um, particularly with Kickstarter, you have to have an Amazon account to make that contribution. So for people who are contributing to it, it gives them a little bit of a barrier, you know, for, for, which reduces their ability to impulse purchase. So it's, it's very different um, in terms of which crowdsource to pick. And it will depend on, you know, what incentives you're offering and how you want to, um, your time frame, how quickly you think you can raise the money. Um, but you want to look at, uh, let's say we want to create a 64-page graphic novel, which usually will, you can get a lot of novels condensed into a 64-page graphic novel. And you've got to consider when you're doing this that the, your artist is going to spend a very long time doing this book. So they need... They need money to do it, particularly if they're not getting a, a, a split of the creative rights. There's a lot of issues that come into this. Hopefully that article on my website will help people really access this idea. But um, you want to look at what it would cost them per page. Um, novelists work on advances, um, you know, where you'll get from a traditional publishing company in advance for your book. And comic book artists work on page rate. So you want to figure out, okay, what do I really need to pay my uh, pay my artist per page um, to do this? And then you would multiply that by the amount of pages, and you begin to need to figure out at that point, you know, what you will need to clear to get your book done in a reasonable amount of time. Hmm. Um, and uh, that's that's the way to to get it to get the book funded. Getting it into print is 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 relatively very simple. You can usually. Uh, you know you, that's that's not the difficult part. The difficult part is the patience it takes to um, to get it done and the um, the page rate. You know to get it produced. Um, mm. It's a very it's a different process than than working on a novel. Um, it usually will take the artist longer to do the graphic novel than it will take the writer to write the novel. I know novelists who can write three novels in the time I can do a 64-page graphic novel. So, you know, especially if it's in color, if it's in this beautiful painted color, um, you know, it, it, there's a lot of artists' prices will, and needs will vary. So, um, you know, you just, but I would look at the number of pages hmm. versus what your artists will need um, to spend as close to full time as possible working on the book because hmm. that's what it's going to take. You can't just casually do the art on a graphic novel it's it's a it's a it's a big process they you can shoot a feature film in a shorter period of time than it takes to do a graphic novel but <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it is pretty major. And just a question on rights. Um, I mean, it's fine if, like me, you're, you know, you self-publish and you uh, own all the rights. But if people have signed uh, contracts with people, what, what is the subsidiary right that graphic novel would come into? So if they've sold print rights, have they sold graphic novel rights or does it come under multimedia or do you, do you know about that side of it? Well, that's an excellent question, and um, there's a lot of um, legal considerations to be, especially when you're if you're negotiating with a traditional publisher or you're negotiating with anybody where there's rights issues involved. I would highly recommend that you know you reserve to yourself the graphic novel rights or the adaptation rights or negotiate it with your publisher because believe me, they'll want to uh, they'll want to have a say in that and. Um, it's very important that uh, you know that the graphic novels and other types of media adaptations, web comic adaptations, audiobook adaptations, all these things uh, need to be 
need to be spelled out in any legal contract. It needs to be spelled out in a legal contract between the author and the artist, you know, because um, the artists are doing a lot of original designs, a lot of, of things. And so if it's going to be a work for hire arrangement with the artist, that needs to be spelled out. If there's a certain um, percentage of creator rights that are going to switch or, or, or change hands, that needs to be spelled out. Um, it's something that has to be looked at at every level and every detail, um, you know, in order to avoid uh, misunderstandings. It's better for everybody. and uh, mm -hmm. But it's not that complicated. It just needs to be addressed directly. Mm, yeah, I just wanted to raise that because I know some people listening to the show have sold some rights. So it's just a, just a question that is it, yeah. important. Yeah, and, 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 and when you're looking, if you're a novelist working with a traditional publishing house, um, they may be very interested if you approach them in, in adapting your novel to a graphic novel. And they may be able to provide the funding for that themselves. Um, so they may be interested in, in doing that. So it's well worth approaching them and saying, you know, look, i got a great artist who's willing to do this. You know, uh, we've got to figure a certain percentage of the sales we've already made. We can definitely make with this graphic novel. The, all the ancillary benefits, the increased um, benefit and likelihood of the book being translated to film. Uh, a lot of traditional publishing houses, Harper Collins is working with Neil Gaiman and mm. uh, graphic novels, and uh, I mean those are those are big business. So they're definitely worth um, definitely worth talking to traditional publishers about it, mm. and uh, indie publishers, self publishers, you know. Uh, they still have these, you know, these issues to address with whomever they're going to subcontract or work with as a partner to do their graphic novels. Wow, it's so interesting, and we could we could talk forever on this. I have so many questions, but we're we're running out of time. So just tell people a bit more about Viscera. Um, Viscera is my attempt uh, to do an actual feminist superheroine. Um, you know, since um, uh, Gloria Steinem put Wonder Woman on the cover of the first Miss magazine in 1972, I believe it was, um, you know, people have been looking for what a, a feminist superheroine would be. What would she look like? What would she do? And Viscera um, is my attempt to create that character. Um, she's uh, in the mold of Sarah Connor from The Terminator, and also she's got a lot of Elizabeth Salander from The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, uh, a lot of punk sensibilities, and she's fighting um, really uh, the rape culture. I figured if a feminist super superhero is going to exist, what is she going to fight? What is the front line of the feminist struggle? And I thought, well, it's it's they've been the ones that have that have named what rape is, they defined it and began to fight for those rights, you know, in, in the 60s um, and 70s. And um, I think that that's what a feminist superheroine would do. What Wonder Woman would not come to man's world to bring hope to it. She'd come to destroy it. She'd come to say, okay, it isn't a man's world. This is a world for everybody. And um, so Viscera is a very dark story. It's a, very, it's a story that comes with trigger warnings. And it's it's about very a very dark subject um, that is I think suitable to um, a feminist philosophy where feminists are always having to come out and say things nobody wants to hear, you know they don't want to hear that stuff. But and it's not a book designed by the rules which you often discuss on your show. I broke most of them knowing what they were, <laughs> but it was a book written out of passion rather than out of um, hmm. some sort of. Um, desire to to create a a, a, a bestseller I, I know mm. it will never be that you know mm. but I other projects hopefully will come along that will that will sell more but people have, some people have been kind enough to say that um, that it's meant something to them it's it's dedicated to survivors of violence and uh, I think more people need to speak about it particularly more men mm. and um, so it's not an activist book it's a paranormal thriller it's uh, you know really dark experimental and uh, hopefully people will like it. Yeah, and I, I really, I, I, I think enjoy is a, is the wrong word. I mean, it's it's not a light, it's not a light-hearted, enjoyable kind of read. But it's in terms of the fact that I like you know women who are kind of you know, I like writing violent women as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a with a superhero. There's a great cathartic relief, you know, because. She gets to fight this rape culture directly. You know, she mm. can stab it. Yeah. She can stab it. 
<laughs> in the chest, you know, and kill it, you know. Whereas people in the real world, you know, it's much more, it's much more shadowy. It's much more difficult to get a handle on. And so uh, I think, in that sense, hopefully, it's a cathartic, um, you know, release for people. And uh, it does have humor in it. Yeah. Um, and and really, um, the the great trauma that the tension may build up. Is, is really never going to happen. Viscera is always five steps ahead of everybody around her. She's smarter. She's 4'11", 89 pounds, but you wouldn't want to mess with her. <laughs> she <laughs> will have outwitted you long before you entered the room. And, and so she has that kind of, uh, that, that's the source of her strength. Is she's always got tricks in reserve. Mm, fantastic. So where can people find you and also the Viscera comic online? Um, well, my website is NathanMassengill.com, and uh, that's the site anybody can get in touch with me if they want to talk more about graphic novels or how to adapt any of their work. Uh, Ringrunning.com um, is uh, Viscera's website, and um, people can, can um, access the article that I mentioned um, on both, through both sites. Mm, fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Nathan. That was amazing. Yeah, thank you for, so much for the work you do. It's very inspiring.